Well, uh, I'm going to try something now um, to give you a feel of uh, what a KST lecture sounds like, um, but this one's a little bit ambitious. In a few minutes, I'm going to give you an overview of the book of Revelation. Uh, it's nothing like being ambitious. The book of Revelation is one of my favourite books, I have to say. I've been teaching it from it from years in the context of uh, KBC, KBCTC, KTC, and now KST, uh, and, and I love it, uh, and I feel it has a lot to say into our situations and churches today. In particular, it speaks to uh, persecuted peoples, because uh, the, the book of Revelation was written for churches that were facing huge pressure uh, and persecution under the Roman Empire. And uh, it just is a fact that whenever churches in other nations face the sort of pressure of persecution and hardship and, and being picked on or driven out of areas or whatever, Revelation becomes a very precious book. Now, you might think Revelation is difficult to understand, and there are parts of it that are difficult to understand. But the overall uh, picture of what happens in the book of Revelation is really quite simple. Um, at the beginning, John says, uh, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ. In other words, this book is centred totally on Jesus, who Jesus is, and all that Jesus has done. And so what I want to do in the next 15 minutes is just to try and show you, if I can, five big pictures of Jesus from the book of Revelation, and to just give us a little understanding of how we're supposed to see him. So the first picture, unsurprisingly, comes right in chapter 1, where John, the Apostle John, who's uh, who's in exile on Patmos, unable to get to the churches, uh, has visions of Jesus which are for the churches. It's all about Jesus speaking to the churches and he sends letters to seven churches in Asia Minor which we read in chapters two and three but first of all in chapter one we have this big picture of Christ walking amongst the churches. Actually the Apostle John sees first of all seven candlesticks and, uh, and Christ gives him the key to uh, these candlesticks. They are the life of the seven churches who are living for Christ and witnessing for him and shining out for him. And um, as he starts, he sees first of all the seven candlesticks and then he sees a figure. And this figure sums up some of the images that we have of times when God appeared to people in the Old Testament. Uh, and so he's dressed in the, uh, in the robes of a high priest. This is a priestly figure. Uh, he's one like a son of man. Son of man is the one who comes from heaven to live on the earth uh, as God. Um, and so he's the heavenly son of man, who's also a high priest, whose hair is as white as wool, which speaks of the all-wise one. Grey hair obviously speaks of some wisdom, but the one with all-white hair is the all-wise one, who, uh, who speaks with uh, the clarity of the sword, whose eyes are like blazing fire, full of insight. This is all about Jesus walking in the midst of the church. He's walking around these seven candlesticks and, and the, the vision just sums up the greatness and majesty of the Son of God who walks amongst the churches. Vision number one, Christ is right in the middle of his church when they're under pressure. He's not sitting up in heaven comfortably putting his feet up because his job's done. He's still with the church. He's walking amongst the church. He's available to the church. He's praying for the church as the high priest. He's dispensing wisdom to the church as the all-wise one. Uh, he's speaking uh, with authority to the church, um, and he, he's there. When the church is under persecution, he's there. When the church is in hardship, he's there. When the church may be is fearing some compromise around them, he's there. In their half-heartedness, 
he's there. In their dryness, he's there. The all-sufficient Christ is right at the centre of his church, uh, right where they are in Asia Minor, under pressure, wherever in the world they are, Christ is walking amongst his people. The next massive picture of Jesus in the book of Revelation comes when the Apostle John is sort of called up into the heavenly throne room. He experiences the worship of the angels and heavenly beings, and he's part of that worship. And in the midst of this heightened sense of worship around the throne of God, uh, he has a vision. And he has a vision of uh, a scroll that is uh, firmly held and that can't be opened. This scroll is the scroll of the world's history and destiny, and it's locked up and it's sealed up. And this, this vision is so intense for uh, the Apostle John that, uh, that he's sort of feeling uh, exactly what it's like as he's going into it. It's, it's like one of those dreams you have where you end up running in the bed or something because you're, you're in your dream and you're acting it out. And, and you know it's a dream, but, but you're, it, you're part of it. And you're caught up with it. And sometimes it's a relief to wake up and get out of it. But, but John's in this vision. He's caught up with it. And, and the tragedy of this vision that he has is that the destiny of the world can't be unlocked, it can't be opened up um, because, because it's locked up by these things that seal it, the bondage of sin and the ravage and corruption of the fall and suffering and death and, and godless aimlessness and, and all of these seals lock up the destiny of the world, that's how it is. Our world has been locked up by the corruption of the fall and by the sin that uh, is endemic in all of us and, and by death, which was a penal event. It wasn't, we weren't supposed to die in the first creation purposes of God. Death became the penalty because of our sinfulness. And, uh, and so the history of the world is locked up by all of these things and by strife in the nations and war and, and, and so on. And, and the Apostle John weeps because, uh, because of this vision and that the destiny of the world is locked up. It is a tragedy. He says, and who can open the scrolls of this destiny? No one was found, the story goes. No one was found in chapter 5 who could open the scroll. And then uh, he, has a, he has a guide in heaven and... and this guide says to him, don't weep, don't weep. <laughs> there is one who can open the scroll. Uh, one of the elders said to him, see, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, John says looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he'd taken it, the four living creatures and elders fell down and they worshipped because the Lamb was worthy to open the scroll. And in chapters 6 and 7 of Revelation, we have the scroll of the destiny of the world being opened by the Lamb and by the victory of the blood that he shed on the cross. Um, here's our second mega vision of Jesus in the book of Revelation. He is the one who unlocks our destiny and unlocks the destiny of the whole earth and every nation. He is at the centre of this one. The next big picture we come to is in chapter 12. Uh, and it's, it's a picture of heavenly warfare that is going on. Um, and actually the book of Revelation starts off by 
talking about what Christ is doing in the earth and what he has done on, on the earth. And in chapter 12, we go up to another level. And it's like we're taken behind the scenes of what's going on in the earth to what's going on in heaven and in heavenly places. And here we find that the, 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 the woman who speaks of the people of God uh, and the dragon are in conflict and it's because of the baby that is born, this, uh, this child come from heaven, this one who is to a rule with an iron scepter. That means an unbending rod of righteousness. And there is warfare that surrounds, uh, that surrounds the people of God and surrounds this, this heavenly ruler as well. In verse 10 we read this, Now... Have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil's gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Here's our third big picture of Christ who overcomes the dragon, who overcomes the enemy, and who has overcome the accuser. Satan is God's enemy and ours. He is a usurper and an accuser. And we overcome him by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is the powerful weapon against Satan. Through the shedding of the blood of Jesus, sin and death and Satan were destroyed once and for all. And we overcome him through the power of that blood of Jesus and by being faithful in our testimony to who Christ is. This is a powerful picture. So, First picture, Christ is right in the middle of his church under pressure. Secondly, he's the one who unlocks our destiny. Thirdly, he's the one who overcomes the accuser uh, in chapter 12. Fourth picture comes in chapter 21. It's the picture of Christ who renews and restores all things. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice on the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. So this picture is of Christ, who is the one who renews and restores all things. Uh, if we... If we're walking through difficulty now, we can be beset by hopelessness or despair or, or negative thinking or wondering if our salvation is going to come. There's all sorts of ways that we can uh, end up feeling under pressure. But he's the one who renews and restores all things. He restores our hearts, our lives, our motives, our desires, our fickleness, our weakness. He restores and renews us from walking in sin to walking in the Spirit of God. We don't walk under the sentence of death. We are the ones who've received resurrection life from Jesus, which goes on forever. Uh, we might have been wandering before, but now he gives us uh, life and hope and purpose. Our bodies, <laughs> which might be wasting away, <laughs> might not work as well as they could. Our bodies are destined for resurrection because everything is going to be renewed and restored. The whole creation 
is having evil purged out of it, all the frustration and the imperfection and the shame and the insecurity and the shadow that pervades it and influences it, all of that is going to be cleared out when Christ comes to renew all things, because he's the one who makes everything new. And the final picture, the final picture is chapter 22, it's of Christ himself, who is the unveiled source of our life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They'll see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There'll be no more night. They'll not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign for ever and ever. This is a great picture of Christ himself dwelling in the midst of his people. Of course, he does by his spirit now. But the day is coming when our fellowship with Jesus will be unfettered and unhindered and, uh, and will be face to face. He is himself, the river and the light and the life. And so we drink of his spirit now in anticipation, knowing that one day our fellowship is going to be totally unhindered uh, and, and free flowing. We drink of him now in anticipation and we say, even so, come Lord Jesus. We look forward to the completion of this great work which has already started in us. These Christians in Asia Minor who are under severe uh, pressure and persecution of a godless state and a godless empire under the power of Rome are encouraged with these huge visions of Jesus Christ. Number one, he's walking amongst the church. He hasn't forgotten you. You may feel like you're under huge pressure. You don't know how it's going to finish, but Jesus is right there. Uh, he's praying for you. He's dispensing wisdom to you. He's giving you grace. He's giving you clarity as you walk with him. Don't give up, people of God. Secondly, keep focused on him because he's the one who unlocks our destiny. No one else in the world can unlock the destiny of this world. Politicians can't. Emperors can't. Uh, petty rulers can't. Other gods can't. Christ alone is the one who is worthy to set this world free from the bondage of sin and the ravages of the fall and suffering and death. Keep your eyes fixed on him. What's more, if you're facing hardship and warfare and you feel like the dragon's after you, Satan himself is accusing you, Satan is bringing you down, Christ is the one who overcomes the accuser. He overcomes the accuser by his blood, and every time you witness to him and you mention his name and you're true to him, he strengthens you in his spirit, in your spirit. Uh, he's the one who overcomes the accuser. When you're under pressure, look to him. He's the strengthener. He's the overcomer. Christ is the one who renews and restores all things. And everything that you long and hope for is coming to pass as Christ brings about the end of these heavens and earth in order to establish new heavens and new earth. And Christ himself will be the unveiled source of our, of our life. The fellowship you've longed for uh, with Christ uh, will one day be your portion. Don't give up now. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ. These visions of Christ are wonderful. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. Now there's some detail uh, that's a bit troublesome in the book, no question about it. You can get more of that sorted out if you come to KST. Uh, but these wonderful visions of Christ are the pillars uh, for a people who are seeking to live for Christ in difficult days, in difficult circumstances. Keep your eyes fixed on him.